This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today has been called the most important psychologist alive today. His name is Daniel Kahneman. He's the winner of the 2002 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. Prospect theory, for those of you in the trend-following world. Behavioral economics, behavioral finance. He is the guy. He started it all along with his partner many years ago. I welcome him to my podcast. I hope you enjoy. I was looking at your career, looking at all the research and findings, everything behind what you've done, and obviously we're not going to fill it in on this conversation. But at what point in your life did you start to realize that you were comfortable looking at the world, people, behavior from outside the norm? When, when did you first realize that you were looking at things from a different vantage point? I think fairly difficult question. I, I, like, uh, I like to get the hard ones right out of the gate. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, when in both science, of course, you publish things because you think that they're new. Uh, we're, what we didn't see was how far our research would be taken. So we studied, Amos Tosky and I began our, our work by studying judgment under uncertainty, uh, you know, a limited set of problems of judgment. And we worked on that five years, and we wrote an article at the end of those five years in 1974, which was published in Science. That article had a lot more impact and resonance than we had anticipated. And and it was really in, in seeing that reaction that we realized that we had done something that was unusual, because people were reacting to it as if it were unusual. Uh, so it was somewhere between 1974 and 1980, uh, we became aware that people were taking this as new. They were taking it as newer than we had taken it. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's for me in my world, the world of money and markets, your work is right there for me, at least from where I come from is right there as the foundation. If, if people were to say to me, Hey Mike, what's the best way to learn about, uh, making money in the markets or being successful in the markets, I would point them towards your work. I mean, I, I think it's a found it's, it's one foundational element that if people don't wrap themselves around the internal themselves, they're just not going to do very well. And I, I think you really, I don't think you intended perhaps to have so many people on wall street be thinking fondly of your work, but it so happened that way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, this, this all came, this all really came as a surprise. Uh, we had not expected it. I mean, there, you know, there was going to be some reaction to the assumption of rationality and to the dominance of the rationality assumption in, in finance and economics. Uh, it happened that we provided, uh, we provided an instrument that people inside the discipline could use to question, uh, you know, to question the dogma of rationality. It's actually quite, it's an interesting anecdote how this happened and and the reason why our work had impact because it's it's actually quite it's accidental why our work had impact it had impact because of the way that we present our ideas and we present our ideas by examples in the text of questions that people tend to get wrong and so the readers who are not psychologists readers outside the discipline they read this and they face those demonstrations that work on them. And and it's when something works on you that you're inclined to change your views about human nature. Uh, merely getting data about undergraduates or some other people responding to questions does very little to people. Yeah, it's it's re reading about others is one thing, but when you see the change internally on your, your own self, that's when uh, the magic the magic can happen. When you see yourself making mistakes or tempted to make mistakes, then the idea that people 
generally, you know, people who are as smart as you are are tempted to make mistakes. That is a, that's a discovery. It's, it makes it much harder for people to distance themselves from the findings. And I think that it's this accident of format that caused our work to have the impact it did. I want to shift away from your early work to something that's been near and dear to you recently, and that's the subject of happiness. I mean, it's always been, I'm sure it's always been near and dear to you, but I would love for you to get into something that I think can help people regardless of what they're, they're interested in their life. And it's the, the idea of the remembering self in the experiencing self. And, and that out of the gate might sound very academic to a, just a, a regular audience listening, but I think it's a very important distinction that you've drawn. Why don't you just talk about the experiencing self and the remembering self out of the gate? Well, sure. You know, there are really, two types of questions that you can ask people about how happy they are. So you can ask them, how do you feel right now? You know, what is your mood right now? And that is, you know, the self that answered this question I call the experiencing self because it talks about what's happening right now. But when you ask people, how was your vacation? How happy were you during your vacation? Or how happy have you been over the last year? Or how satisfied are you with your life? When you're asking those general questions, you're asking for something entirely different. You are asking persons, how do you feel about your life? Now that you're thinking about your life, how do you think about your life? How that makes you feel? So how you feel as you're living and how you feel when you're thinking about your life are two very different questions. And it turns out that you can measure well-being, subjective well-being in both ways by asking people to report on their experiences or by asking people to think about their life and evaluate it. And different factors turn out to be important for experience and for uh, life evaluation. But there's quite a bit of confusion between the two. I mean, it, for example, I think you had a story about taking photographs on a vacation. Well, yes. I mean, uh, we seem to be planning our vacations uh, in many cases. And we plan our vacations as uh, constructing memories that we, for use in later consumptions, and photographs are symbolic of that. But, in fact, my argument has been that if you look at it in terms of uh, how much time people spend consuming their memories, then that is a negligible amount of time compared to the amount of time that they spend having experiences. And yet we put a disproportionate amount of weight on the consumption of memories. Well, I'm sure you've observed this. So you watch uh, you watch young people today. They Everyone's got a, a smartphone and it's a constant taking of pictures of themselves called selfies. And it seems like it seems like instead of living and experiencing the moment, everyone is trying to capture an artificial moment and capture a memory, but the experiencing's not there. I, it's, I don't know if you've, no, you've probably noticed this yourself. Well, I mean, I don't do that, but, uh, but certainly the, the ability to record so many things that they are happening to you must be changing the experience of life because you are evaluating your experiences as future memories. And, and in a way, when you're taking pictures of what you see, you're adopting a different stance on, on the experience itself. So certainly this is having an effect. What effect it has, at least I don't know. I haven't analyzed it. Yeah, I don't know what's happening there. It doesn't seem like it's necessarily uh, uh, good or bad. It's all relevant, but uh, or, or relative. But let me jump. I want to. I only got you for a short amount of time, and I want to jump to a couple different areas that I think are really important to my audience, and some very strong thoughts that that sound very straightforward. But I think, for example, a quote of yours that I've seen: "A person who has not made peace with his losses is likely to accept gambles." They would be unacceptable to him otherwise. Now, that can have meaning far different fields. But in my world, in my world of, of trading, of finance, of money, of Wall Street, that not making peace with a loss is uh, this, this is the downfall of, of so many investors. And here you're coming at it. I don't imagine you were thinking through some of that work with investing and trading in mind, but it's foundational 
I mean, every great, every great trader knows what you just said is like, that's like written on the wall in some form or another. Well, uh, of course, we weren't thinking of uh, specifically of, of investors, but it turns out there is research that demonstrates this. So we know about traders, how they trade in the course of the day. And if they've been losing, uh, they take more risks later in the afternoon. So uh, that seems to be, you know, the idea of uh, not making, you haven't made peace with your losses. That means that you're trying to make up those losses. That tends to make you risk-seeking. And uh, we do see a lot of evidence for that. And and it probably is costly to traders. Now, I'm not, you know, in the extreme cases, people, you know, traders who trade so much that they can't make, you know, peace with their losses. Uh, some of them get caught up in cycles of fraud and, you know, they become broke traders. But that, those are the exceptions. But traders who are not rogue traders do tend to vary in risk-seeking depending on the history of what's happened to, to them during the day or during the year. Let me shift slight gears on you and talk about bubbles and crowd behavior. And generally, it seems, and I know your research goes there, but that when people get together in crowds, the decision-making changes. Well, yes. I mean, you know, what, what we see is we are, and that is probably biological, you know, ultimately it's biological, it's following other people, so that uh, when you see a lot of people running in one direction, uh, we are by and large wired to run in the same direction. Now, a few very clever people uh, will run in another direction, but the majority of us, uh, you know, we see, we see the herd moving one way, we move with it. And that has large consequences, of course, for market behavior. It, by and large, what it causes, uh, it causes people individually to do far less well than the market says they should because they tend to come in too late when the market is rising and they can, you know, and so the people's timing is way off and as a result of trying to follow the, the herd, uh, they do much less well than they would do if they were basically adopting a policy and sticking to it. Is there anything else you'd rather be doing in your life than this? I, you, I mean, I look through your work and, and the findings, and I, I just I just imagine you're terribly passionate about what you do. Well, yes. Uh, you know, I've, I, I now do other things. Uh, you know, I, I've retired from my academic career, and I'm, uh, I now do consulting, which I enjoy just as much as I enjoy it science. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a fun career. And the topic has been was fun. And when I started out this line of research, uh, you know, like 45 years ago with Amos Tversky, this was sheer fun because he was a very funny person with a re marvelous sense of humor and we were laughing all the time. So we laughed for about 12 years uh, doing, doing our research. And what, what made it funny was that we were studying our own biases and our own mistakes. Our point was not that people are stupid because we never thought that people are stupid. And we never thought that we were stupid. But it's, it's our own mistaken intuitions we were studying. And that, that must have been the best fun I've had in my life, those years of working on that topic. Yeah. Cause it, and I mean, I assume the two of you were just to some degree off on your own island and just doing your thing. And, the rest of the world was was there, but you were engaged uh, 100% in, in your endeavors, and I'm sure that feeling must have been great. Yes, it was. I mean, you know, we were friends, and and for more than 10 years, I think, we spent about half a day just together talking, which is very unusual in scientific contribution collaborations. So we had, you know, we were extremely fortunate. We liked each other's company, and our topic was fun. And our topic was one that could be studied while having a fun conversation. That is, you you examine your own intuitions, you you raise puzzles, you see how the other responds, uh, you develop theories and and puzzles and intuitions of the same kind. It was yeah, it was great to do. You know, I I watch leaders often leaders making public policy and 
near and dear to you is the topic of happiness that we just mentioned a second ago. But talk about happiness research and public policy. It seems like like uh, you, we're, we're listening, looking at the example of you and your partner at that time and happy to go through this process and you're learning and you're you're finding all these new things out. But it seems like today, it seems like so many leaders when it comes to public policy, you don't ever hear anyone talk about happiness. It's just left out of the equation. I think that's not quite right, actually. Uh, the official, you know, the study of happiness is an official task within the UK government, and the UK government, the current coalition government, put in subjective well-being as as one of the objectives of policy and of one of the measures of policy. So uh, trying to keep a happy population is is rapidly becoming an, an accepted objective of policy. There, there have been, you know, major international commissions. This is a measurement of happiness is... Uh, a uh, formal measurement of happiness is now uh, routine and part of policy in the UK, in Canada, in many European countries, uh, in Australia, things are beginning to move in this direction. And even in this country, there is serious talk of measuring, uh, of, of implementing measurements of well-being. There are questions about how this is to be done and whether we are ready for the measurement and whether the whether the measurement and our understanding of happiness is mature enough to base policy on it. So there, there's room for debate about that. But uh, that, that there is increasing recognition of the role of well-being in policy, I think, is beyond doubt. Let me go at a few more topics with you. Emotion. So much emotion in individuals, driven by possibility and not probability. I think that's that's probably intuitive, but it's not necessarily when it comes to decision making being driven by possibility versus probability leaves us with some not great results often, doesn't it? Well, I mean, I suppose that's what you're talking about is hope and fear, and uh, so when you're looking at you know at, at uh, entrepreneurial activity, it is we have argued, largely driven by optimism. So that when people take risks, at least that's, you know, that's my main understanding of risk, is that much of the time when people take risks, it's because they don't know the odds that they're facing. They're actually deluding themselves. So in in my view of the risk takers, um, they are on the one hand loss averse, they hate to lose, but on the other hand, they are, Optimistics, quite often to a delusional degree, so that they don't really know the true probability that they face of losing, and that's a, that's that's the combination that produces risk and risk taking. But it's mainly driven by optimism, and and you can see that in entrepreneurs, you can see that in people with discoveries and are trying to bring them to market. You can see that in people who. Uh, start small businesses. You know, the average small business in the United States, uh, there is 35% survival after f- after five years, as I recall. But most people start a new business, assign themselves a probability of 80% or higher to be successful. So it's that delusion that keeps them going. And I've called optimism the engine of capitalism because uh, it is, in that sense, very beneficial to society. But many people would not be taking the risk they take if they knew the risk they are taking. You know, obviously, you've had a major dent in thought and people investigating the issues that you've laid out, understanding, believing, knowing it's true. How much of a dent, though, I'm curious, do you think that something like prospect theory, how much of a dent has it really made in the sense, I mean, obviously you've made a dent, but the acceptance, because when I look at, I look at, uh, for example, you could look at the current U.S. equity market right now. I have no idea if it's fairly valued or not fairly valued, but we can all observe in the last 15 years, some quite fantastic bubbles and some quite fantastic busts. 
I don't really think that uh, the advances in behavior economics and behavioral finance, and I'm, I'm a customer, I'm not a producer of that, and I'm really not an expert, but my impression is that uh, very bright people are working on this, very bright people are trying to develop theory, but it's early days for behavior economics and behavioral finance. When you say, has it made a dent? Uh, well, the answer is clearly yes, because in some of the major economics departments and finance departments in the land uh, have behavioral economics and behavioral finance as a central part of, of their curriculum. You know, at the Harvard Economics Department, one of the best in the country, uh, there are, you know, some of the major stars there are behavioral economists, and some, of the, and the best students are going there. Many of the best students are going there, so that you know that it has made a dent because of what graduate students are doing is telling you something both about the recent past and about the uh, the near future. The near future, there's going to be a lot of behavior economics going because many very bright scholars are going into the field. Yeah, I, I should probably clarify myself. I obviously was not trying to say it hasn't made a dent, but I guess I was thinking more about the the more established field of, of economics, the the more rational, the more rational side of the coin where where you're coming in it from a different perspective. And there's there's always going to be that conflict bet- between the two. Oh, I mean, there is. You yeah. know, I mean. It, it, there was something almost funny about uh, the last Nobel Prizes uh, that were given because uh, the, the Nobel Prize in economics was given to two people, both of them students of finance, with radically different ideas, so that you have Eugene Fama, who is a traditionalist and, and believes in the rational agent model, believes quite passionately about it, and in the rationality of markets. And on the other hand, you've got uh, Bob Schiller, who is, uh, you know, who speaks about irrational exuberance and uh, and doesn't believe in the rationality of markets. So both of these currents are alive and well within finance. Uh, my sense is that <clears throat> there is a lot that the younger people may be drifting in the direction of behavioral finance, but I'm not sure. This is an impression that I get. Hmm. Can I can I get you to go back to your really early years for a moment? We've only got a few minutes left, but I would love for you to to go back to as a young man because I think when people listen to people that have had some achievement in their life and and they've they've gone down certain paths, it's always nice to kind of look back and say, well, can I relate to that person? Can I, you know, it's it's very difficult to relate to somebody that maybe receives a Nobel Prize, but can you relate to that man as a young man? And I'm wondering if you might talk about maybe some of your early experiences. And I think there was one experience, and I believe it was in France, and I believe it was with, with a German soldier. And you you walked away from that changed. Yeah, I mean, I can tell the experience. I mean, it was during, uh, during the war. Uh, I was seven years old, 1941, in occupied France, France occupied by the Germans. And they were beginning the, you know, the, the measures against Jews. It wasn't extermination yet, but they were getting ready. And so the Jews were supposed to wear a Star of David, a yellow Star of David, uh, and there was a curfew for Jews. And I was a uh, first grader or a second grader, probably, and uh, and I was playing with a friend, and I went past the curfew. And so I put my sweater inside out and, and walked home. And then near home, in a place I still remember, uh, this was in Paris. Uh, there was a German soldier facing me and uh, walking towards me, and he was wearing a black uniform, which I knew, although I was only seven years old, was a bad one because it was the SS that were wearing the black uniforms. And uh, and he approached me, and I, you know, I must have been shaking. I don't, you know, I don't remember every detail. But what I do remember is uh, he stopped me. He called me, and. And he picked me up and, and he hugged me and I remember being terrified that he would, he would see the yellow star, uh, inside my sweater as he was hugging me. And then he put me down and he opened his wallet and, uh, took out the picture of a little boy and showed it to me. And then he gave me some money and I went home. And it was the complexity of that experience that you, he was a man, you know, who was clearly uh, quite ready and, and, perhaps eager to kill people like me, but 
There he was, he has a son, he loved his son, I reminded him of his son. And, uh, so, yeah, that, it was the kind of experience of the complexity of human beings that has guided me as, you know, it has inspired, I think, a lot of my work. Uh, I've been curious about people all my life. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I think a lot of people might be envious when they, if, and I highly recommend them to take a look at some of your books, but it's, it's such a fun topic to be an observer of the human condition, just to, to watch people, to observe, and then to find things out that maybe you didn't expect to see. That's such a fun process. Oh, yes, that's what I was saying. It has been a fun career. Well, listen, I, I don't want to keep you. You were kind enough to take some time out today. I will go ahead and point people to any place you might want. It might just be Amazon to check out one of your books. I know you're not trying to sell anything or promote anything. People can go check out uh, Thinking Fast and Slow is one book. I know there's there's quite a few. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it really is the only one that is that was written for the public. And, you know, it's still there. It's actually on the bestsellers list. It has been for since it was published, I think. So uh, it's easy to get. It's two ninety nine on Kindle. I don't know why <laughs> Amazon serves it like that, but that's how they sell it. Anyway, that's that's the, the book in which I, I told the, the whole story of uh, my research and, and related research with other people. It's not an autobiographical book. It's a book about, about thinking and decision-making. Well, I love it. I mean, I just, I love the topic. Uh, I think it's so foundational to my audience. And I, I still think there's probably some people out there that they say, well, Mike, you're, you, you've, you've gone off the deep end. Well, why does this, uh, why does this gentleman at Princeton or what, what, what is, what is the relevance here? I think some people just don't get it, but there's, there's quite a few that do. And I think they're, they're appreciative to, to be turned on to new ways of thought and thinking. So I appreciate all your work and I appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you very much for having me. Take care. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.